As an example of a four variable system, what we're going to do is look at our double mass system here with k equals 3 for both springs and both masses having one kilogram of mass. From Newton's second law, we can write down the differential equation because the mass times acceleration of the first mass is going to be negative 3 times the position of mass 1. So let's put a marker here that says this is x1 equals 0, the equilibrium point. And this point here would be x2 equals 0, with positive being in that direction. The first spring, when we move the mass out, it gets stretched and pulls with a negative force back. Then we have another spring force here, but we've seen this before. It depends on the difference between x1 and x2. At equilibrium, they're both 0. I wish I had two pointers here. If we move both of them over to 1, though, so we move this one to here and this one equally, there would be no stretch in this moved or translated version. And if we look at the math, if we translate them both by the same amount relative to their equilibrium, then we get zero for this and we get zero force. And that's exactly what we want. The only gotcha is we need this to be negative out front. So when x1 is positive and we just move x1, this spring pushes back, so we have a negative value out front. What that boils down to if we use mass equals 1, so we can get rid of that, is x1 double prime is minus 6x1s plus 3x2s. We get the sign cancellation there. For the second mass, its acceleration is dictated just by the second force. It's the only force that acts directly on that mass. And it has exactly the same structure as the second spring here, except with the signs reversed. And again, depending on how you want to do this, you could have also written it as 3 times x1 minus x2, positive 3 instead. The only difference is whether you multiply as negative in, then you get negative x2 and positive x1. So this two-mass system is going to exhibit some fairly complicated behavior, but we can easily write out the differential equations which will let us build our predictions. To use the techniques we've seen, though, we need to reduce this to a first order system. This is a second order. So our process for that conversion to first order is to define a new vector of values. Let's pick an anonymous kind of variable. Let's call it w, which is w1, 2, 3, and 4. We need one variable for every derivative. And what we build it as is x1 and x1's derivative. So position, velocity. And x2 and x2 prime, position and velocity. So we take the same variables, but we break it down a little bit, include a little more information about the derivative. And we'll copy what we've done in earlier examples to translate this mass times acceleration equation into a differential equation about the w's. Here we've copied over the differential equations in second order and the definition of the new variables. The next step is to find what the time derivative of that new w vector is component by component. And all that means is evaluating what the derivative of say w1 is. Well w1 is x1. So its derivative is the same as the derivative of x1. Well, the derivative of x1 is x1 prime. That's what prime means. But x1 prime is w2. Nice and easy. The derivative of w2 is the derivative of x1 prime. So one more derivative running around. That's x1 double prime. And this we have an equation for. We're going to get negative 6x1 plus 3x2s, but x1 is w1, and x2 is not w2. got to be careful, it's w3. But that's it. And then we repeat for the last two, and it turns out that this derivative is w4 with some work in between. And a similar vein, the derivative of w4 is x2 double prime, and that is negative 3x2, let's put them in the right order here, positive 3x1 minus 3x2s, 
that's a W1, and that's a W3. Having done that work, it turns out it's really easy to put this into matrix form. What we're going to do is have W1, 2, 3, and 4 outside, and then we look for the coefficients. So the derivative w1 is just w2, so we get 0, 1, 0, 0. The derivative w2, so this line, is going to be negative 6, w1s, no w2s, a 3, and a 0. Just scanning that part there. The derivative of w3, so this line here, is going to be just w4. And last but not least, we're going to have a 3, 0, negative 3, 0. So we definitely see some structure in this matrix. It's not trivial to generalize this, but you do start to see some common themes when you look at enough physical systems and work with enough mass times acceleration type formulas. So what we've done is created this differential equation in first order form with four variables. And with computer tools, we won't ask you to ever do this by hand, we can compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this four by four matrix. Knowing that we're talking about masses going back and forth, it should not be any surprise at all that we get complex roots or complex eigenvalues because those are what we need to get coses and sines. And notice also there was no friction, so we actually have no exponential decays or growths going on here either. So what we'll get is coses of 2.8t and sine of 2.8t. And there will also be a second set of solutions that involves sine of 1.07t's and cos of 1.07t's. That's exactly what we would do with these values with the i's. They would end up inside the trig functions. Let's get more specific with that and actually write out our general solution. So our w would look like an e to the t, but there's a zero in front of this, so there's no e's. We're going to have e to the zero t's, which is just a one multiplier. So we're going to have a c1 times cos of 2.8t times this vector. And we really do need names for these things. Let's call it v1 and v2 so we don't have to write them out. Uh, v1 minus sine 2.8t times v2. So a scalar times a vector, a scalar times a vector, all times c1 plus a second solution of cos 2.8t times v2. Again, we're swapping the v's, and we're going to change the sign in between to a positive, but we keep the frequency the same. And then we get c3 and a c4 with the same vein, but the frequencies will be different. We'll have cos of 1.07, and let's call that v3. Actually, let's call that u1 and u2, just so they look a bit different. Minus sine of the 1.07, u2, and the cos again, there should be a t there, 1.07t, u2, plus sine of 1.07, u1. So that is our general solution. A little overly complicated, I agree. What we're trying to do now desperately is look for patterns or things that we can learn from this without having to look at every atomic element and understand it. The way we're going to try to understand it is to recognize that there's going to be a way to pick out this form of the solution if we do things right and not have this form of the solution. We know it's this solution when we talk about the fast mode because this is the frequency in radians per second that we're talking about in our cos and sines. So the bigger number here, the higher the frequency. So if we want to only have C1s and C2s and no C3s and C4s, remember that at time zero, that's our initial condition, all we're going to have is C1 times V1 plus C2 times V2 because the sine of zero is zero, all we get are the cosine terms, and plus c3 and plus c4, but those are times u1 and u2. Well, now we know. If we want to elicit just one of these kinds of oscillations, we want to make our initial condition a multiple 
of one of the two eigenvectors here, v1 or v2. So let's do that. We want the initial conditions to be a multiple of, here's v1, here's v2, of v1 or v2. And here we get back to our interpretation of these four long element vectors here. I'm going to focus on v2 and you'll see why in a second. Let's say we took something that was 0 0.36, negative 0, 0 0.22, and 0 as our w naught. Remember what that reflects or what that is defined as in our system. This is x1 of 0 and x1 prime of 0 x2 of 0 and x2 prime of 0, or our initial position, velocity, position, and velocity. For many practical reasons, it's easier to think of taking these masses and moving them a little bit, holding them steady. As soon as we say that, we mean velocity 0, and then letting them go. That's what this scenario here describes. We have zero initial velocities but we do have negative initial or positive initial displacements or positions. What does this correspond to? Well, it corresponds to moving this guy out a bit and this guy out a bit in the other direction, so negative and positive. Now, what we can imagine is we're going to get oscillations that move in and out opposite each other. So what we'd call that is a mode of oscillation, and this will make much more sense when you see it graphically and animated. So I won't go too far into the details here, but basically these masses, oh, I wish I had two pointers, <laughs> are starting away from each other, and then as you let them go, this one moves in, this one moves in, they're going to get close, 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 and then this one's going to move out, this one's going to move out, they're going to go far, 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 and then vice versa, and repeat forever. Going back to our logic here about the initial conditions, of course we don't have to pick these values, it could be a multiple of those, or we could also have picked a multiple of v1, but the challenge there is that we don't know how to necessarily set velocities. This is x1's velocity at time zero, and that's just hard to set. How do I push a mass exactly at one meter per second and this mass exactly at negative 0.62 meters per second? It just seems hard. Whereas positions, we can move things with our fingers and it's all good but both of them would elicit the same mode of vibration. As a complementary problem, of course, we could ask how would we elicit the lower frequency mode of oscillation and what would it look like? Again, let's write it right on here. We're talking positions and velocities, positions and velocities. So I think I'm gonna work with you too if I want to identify positions that are going to give me this mode of oscillation. What we're going to do is pick w at time 0 equal to a multiple of the 0 0.62010. 0, 0. And what that would do, or what that would mean, again, this is the x1 position, this is the x2 position, that would mean moving this mass out 0.62 of a centimeter, or 0.62 of a meter, moving this one out further. And here you can see, I hope, with a bit of imagination, what would happen. We'd stretch both masses out, everything's super stretched, then they're going to move back together. So we're going to have, oh, I wish I had two pointers, we're going to have both of these move back at the same time, sort of in synchrony. So it's going to be uh, an agreement about which direction they're going in, whereas in the fast mode, they were always going in opposite directions. Again, this will be so much easier to see when it's animated later on in this series of videos. For now, it's enough to recognize that we have four vectors to play with. Those values represent positions and velocities, position and velocities, because of the way we created these four variables. And if we want to elicit one of these modes, we just have to pick initial conditions that match one of those vectors.